Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bob Nichols. I'm here with my longtime partner, Leslie Bird. Leslie has practiced labor and employment law exclusively for just about 40 years. I have practiced labor and employment law exclusively for approximately 32 years, and I've had the opportunity to work with Leslie throughout that time. She's taught me a great deal. And an issue that Leslie and I've dealt with clients on repeatedly in recent times is how to more vigorously pursue a diverse and inclusive workforce without creating language or documentation that somehow creates the risk of litigation. For example, what we colloquially sometimes refer to as reverse discrimination uh, over our diversity efforts. How do we pursue diversity aggressively without crossing the legal line? We decided to be a great topic to share with you, so we're gonna spend 30 minutes covering it today. Uh, we're going to hit several basic subjects. I want to talk about why diversity and inclusion are important. Uh, by the way, a couple of housekeeping measures. You'll see uh, in the upper hand, right hand screen of, of your screen, a box where you can submit questions. We won't have time to answer those questions today, but I promise Leslie or I will respond to all questions later. Also, for those of you licensed in Texas or New York, we're approved for CLE. For those of you who are not lawyers who ha or who have other accrediting or licensing organizations, we're glad to give you a certificate of completion. In our experiences, many organizations, accounting organizations, HR organizations, will accept that certificate for continuing education. With those housekeeping matters out of the way, the basic subjects we want to cover today is first, I want to briefly explain why diversity and inclusion is important. You need to know that not only for purposes of today's talk, but to be able to sell this effectively to your employees in a manner that that means something to both minority and majority employees. We then want to talk about some basic terminology diversity, inclusion, affirmative action, and how affirmative action can mean very different things in very different contexts. We want to talk about how to avoid crossing the line specifically. Do's and don'ts in terms of not having a diversity program, which creates evidence of an unlawful discriminatory motive in some respect. Finally, we want to offer advice and recommendations about things you can do in terms of pursuing diversity and inclusion, which are safe and which Leslie and I have found to be effective with our clients. With that said, let's launch into the topic of why diversity and inclusion are important. Well, first of all, there's a moral component to it that's very important to a lot of HR professional executives, CEOs, which is the reality is we live in a company with a country, excuse me, with a long history of job discrimination, race discrimination, sex discrimination, et cetera. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was a watershed moment. Before that time in many parts of the country, including the South, it was not uncommon for employers to take the position that they were interested in quote unquote, whites only for jobs. And in fact, it was difficult to legally pursue claims of race discrimination before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We continue to have very difficult, embedded, systemic problems with discrimination in our country. Consider race. For this country, for 240 years, had the institution of slavery. After the Emancipation Proclamation, we had another 100 years of systemic exclusion of blacks from jobs and other elements of our society. And the after effects, as we'll discuss, of that discrimination remains deeply embedded in our society. The same types of discrimination have affected women, Hispanics in the LBGTQ community. Women had few job choices, particularly before the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Hispanics were not found in many of the more attractive job positions for the most part. In the 1950s, the federal government set out to hunt down and exclude homosexuals from federal employment. We have a long and not very attractive history of job discrimination in this country. So diversity and inclusion are important as an effort to over overcome the lingering effects of that history of discrimination. For those of you who might think the notion that we continue to feel the effects of historic discrimination is, is overblown, let's consider some facts. Uh, 
The Society for Human Resource Management in an article from 2020 quoted an expert who pointed out that nearly 56 years after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, we find equal pay for equal work is still not a reality. That Sherm article pointed out that black men earn 87 cents on the dollar compared to white men. Hispanic men earn 91 cents on the dollar compared to white men. And women, as of 2016, were earning 80 cents on the dollar of what men were earning. My point is, is the, the is the effects of of a long history of discrimination continue to impact people today. Importantly, though, diversity and inclusion are important goals, not only for purposes of justice and morality, but they but diversity is good business. Justice O'Connor, the first female member of the United States Supreme Court, stated in the Grutter case from 2003 that the benefits of diversity for employers are not theoretical, but real. As major American businesses have made clear that the skills needed in today's increasingly global marketplace can only be developed through exposure to widely diverse people, cultures, ideas, and viewpoints, close quote. In other words, statistical analysis has shown more diverse businesses are more profitable. If anyone thinks a madman type culture in the workplace leads to a more profitable business, they are mistaken. A more diverse company is more likely statistically to be a more profitable company. So diversity and inclusion are not only a matter of justice, but a matter of good business. Finally, diversity is critical because of the future of our workforce. As you can see from these statistics, our workforce has grown increasingly diverse. And in fact, by 2045, non-Hispanic whites will represent a minority of the workforce as as a total. So if a company does not pursue the recruitment and advancement of diverse groups effectively, they are at a disadvantage and they are going to become at a bigger disadvantage in terms of competing for employees and succeeding in the business world. Now, I want to turn things to Leslie so she can explain to you, again, some key concepts, including the notion that diversity and in particular affirmative action doesn't always mean just one thing. And you need to understand these terms to be able to follow our advice effectively. Leslie? Thanks, Bob. I'm going to skip quickly to the answer to the question, are diversity and affirmative action programs the same? A diversity program is similar to one type of affirmative action program, but very different from the other. And let me explain. Historically, affirmative action might be a policy practice that overtly considered or preferred, I emphasize preferred, a protected classification. And the consequence of preferring a group is obviously excluding another, likely to achieve a quota. Distinct from giving a preference, which is rarely, rarely lawful, the affirmative action policies and programs we see today are those that do not affirmatively exclude, they do not affirmatively prefer. Rather, affirmative action programs as we see today, are those creative, proactive measures designed to create opportunities to facilitate the rise of females and minorities to the top of the list of qualified individuals, to be hired, to be promoted, to receive equitable pay. Let's turn to federal contractors and OFCCP mandated plans. There's no question that the OFCCP rules involve goals, not quotas or preferences. And it's significant that the OFCCP has concluded, and I'm going to quote because it's very important, goals serve as reasonably attainable objectives and allow contractors to measure progress toward achieving equal employment opportunity. They are not quotas. Again, this is the OSCCP. The OSCCP directs that it does not permit quotas, preferences, or set aside. They are strictly forbidden, end quote. The OSCCP's acknowledgement of the difference between a a quota and a goal is so significant. Goals are numerical, not so precise aspirations based upon factual data, availability of females and minorities, whether externally or internally. 
But the report card, the success is based upon progress, good faith efforts to meet the goals. Failure to meet those goals is, is not unlawful. Failure may be inaction or repetitive inact, ineffective actions or lack of genuine efforts to meet that goal, but simply not meeting a goal is not unlawful. Affirmative action that involves actual preferences are lawful only under very, very limited circumstances. The Supreme Court has generally only permitted actual preferences where the program is designed to eliminate manifest imbalances in traditionally segregated job categories. They do not unnecessarily trammel the interests of non-minority workers or create an absolute bar to their advancement and are a temporary measure to eliminate, and again, a manifest imbalance and is not intended to maintain that balance. I know that was a mouthful. Uh, it comes from a Supreme Court decision uh, entitled United States Workers versus Weber. For those of you who, who know both of us, you will appreciate that when my dear friend Bob Nichols was in middle school, maybe just high school, I was in law school anxiously awaiting this Supreme Court decision, the U.S. Uh, Steelworkers versus Weber, to determine whether or not the Supreme Court was going to determine whether affirmative action was viable or not. The case was the first reverse discrimination case involving affirmative action to come before the Supreme Court under Title VII. And just by way of background, the collective bargaining agreement that was negotiated said that for every two training vacancies, one black and one white was selected. In a very narrow, narrow decision, the Supreme Court found that it did pass Title VII muster. So Title VII, the, the, the court held, could not be construed to bar all private voluntary race-conscious efforts to abolish traditional patterns of racial segregation. But this is a very, very narrow ruling. And when we talk about preferences, it is only lawful under very, very limited circumstances. An employer should consider adopting a program that involves actual preferences only with the careful consideration of counsel, and typically it's because there's a court order or a consent decree which has specifically found discrimination. So in your OSCCP federal affirmative action programs, there is typically no finding of discrimination. For our purposes, and not stepping into the world of affirmative action and college admission policies, which continue controversy up till today, think in terms of facilitating, creating opportunities for higher training promotion, do not prefer or exclude at all. And with this background, enter diversity programs. Diversity programs don't involve quotas, they don't involve preferences, they do not exclude. Diversity is valuing the differences in people and leveraging those differences for a just work environment and a competitive advantage. As we all know, employees, board, clients are increasingly demanding a more diverse and inclusive work environment. Some would say that creating a diverse and inclusive environment workplace is not an option in today's world. It's an imperative. Simply stated, diversity and inclusion are just good for business. Gender diverse companies are 25% more likely to have financial returns above the national industry mediums. Ethically diverse companies, 36% more likely. So diversity and inclusion maximizes employee productivity and innovation, engagement, and teamwork. But for all the good that can result from diversity and the diversity program, 
we must avoid the claims of an illegal program. Bob, my younger but wiser colleague, will guide us in implementing lawful diversity plans. Well, I, I don't know about the wiser part, but I will continue. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about a concern that many of you've had that led us to do this program, which is how do we pursue diversity without crossing the line, Bob, without creating evidence of unlawful intent against, for example, white or male applicants or employees. So let's talk about some keys. First of all, you've got to be very careful about language. Diversity is about equal employment opportunity. It's not, again, about exclusion. And it's easy, particularly for executives, to step over the line. And you have to be very careful with your executives to articulate your diversity program effectively. In the wake of the George Floyd tragedy, Microsoft and Wells Fargo in 2020 pledged to double, promised to double the representation of blacks in their leadership. Uh, the Trump administration through the OFCCP launched an investigation into both companies, suggesting that the statements constituted or were evidence of unlawful discrimination. The OFCCP said the statements appeared to imply that the employment action is being made or taken, open quote, based on race, close quote. Now, ultimately, under the current administration, the OFCCP cleared Microsoft and Wells Fargo of unlawful discrimination with regard to the pledges made. But it points out that you have to be very careful not in for your executives not to describe your diversity program in terms that sound like quotas or set asides. Let's talk about other important practical keys to avoiding creating evidence of unlawful discrimination. Your diver any diversity plan or program documents should point out that you're committed to equal employment opportunity. That means non-discrimination, that hiring decisions and promotion decisions are made based upon merit and other, other legitimate business considerations and never a protected class. Explain to your employees why a diverse workforce is important that it serves the interests of the company, that it makes the company more profitable and successful. The plan should express a desire to achieve a diverse workforce in all respects. Diversity is not just about race or national origin or gender. It's about ideas and backgrounds. People with diverse backgrounds and experiences make for a better, stronger company. Make sure that's part of your written diversity program documentation. Another critical rule of thumb to avoid uh, discrimination litigation over your diversity inclusion efforts. Do not reach the point where you are hiring or promoting people who don't meet the qualifications for the position. If you do that, you ignore facially applicable qualification requirements, there's a very good chance you could lose a subsequent lawsuit by a majority applicant or employee who was unsuccessful in pursuing the position at issue. Again, train all executives to be very careful about their choice of words and understand the nuances between goals and quotas. Educate all employees about your diversity program, maybe not as intensely as your executives, but orient them through your portal, your intranet, your training, and through other means about what your program is and is not. Assure that legal counsel vets all diversity program documentation carefully to make sure that you have not crossed the line or create evidence that you've crossed the line. When you're developing diversity or affirmative action efforts, all the documentation surrounding it ideally will be privileged, which means you'll use in-house or outside counsel as part of the team, and you'll be prepared to argue all the background documentation is privileged in case you become embroiled in litigation later on. And by the way, when you develop these programs, generally you should do it through meetings and not through email strings because people make mistakes and say unfortunate things. Better they say it in a meeting than in an email. Never suggest as part of your diversity program that male or white employees are overrepresented. Again, diversity is not about exclusion. Another tip, if you're profiling on your social media sites or elsewhere and recruiting materials, a variety of employees, never completely omit profiles of non-minority individuals. That sends a message. Be cautious about quoting statistics in your 
in your recruiting materials or in your diversity materials. It's easy if you talk about numerically where you are in terms of the makeup of your workforce, if you make public or open statements about that, for those statements to sound like you're setting a quota or a set aside. Always avoid suggesting that your diversity efforts are about achieving an absolute racial, ethnic, or gender balance. Again, as, as Leslie pointed out, this is about an effort. It is not about achieving quotas or set-asides or achieving goals at all costs. Again, consider use, utilizing the attorney-client privilege with respect to all diversity efforts, most importantly, when you're doing statistical analysis. For example, when you do pay equity analysis, you want to have counsel involved and you want the, a privilege to attach to all those documents, including any reports or studies, um, so that you're not creating evidence of discrimination that's later discoverable in litigation. Now I want to turn things back to Leslie to talk about some some tools, some devices we've discovered and our clients have discovered that are perfectly lawful and effective in advancing the goals of diversity and inclusion. Leslie? Thank you, Bob. And you really are the wiser. Okay. Um, many of the, the tools that we're going to go through, um, we know that that you all, um, as, as good business partners, are already implementing. What we want to do is, is emphasize, uh, we want to emphasize that they are lawful uh, and that they are effective. Um, for example, we we talk in terms of broadening, broadening recruitment reach, because again, we're not going to exclude, we're not going to prefer, but the goal is to have the, the female and the minority rise to the top of the list and be the best qualified. And many of the actions that are uh, helpful in that regard are not direct, they're indirect. You know, basically conducting outreach and recruiting at university and schools with substantial minority representation, historically black colleges, supporting organizations that aren't necessarily uh, employment organizations, but they further the development of educational and developmental opportunities for females and minority. Participating in mentoring programs, whether in high school, even middle school, even elementary school, um, sponsoring scholarships, uh, utilizing internship programs, um, advertising in those um, forums that are targeted to, to women and, and, and minorities. You, I know you've heard the expression casting the net further as it relates to recruitment. And, and that's what we're really trying to do. Um, for example, the OCCP has an employment resource referral directory on its website you're probably familiar with. You can go to a particular location, see what organizations the OCCP is recommending. Um, Again, success in building a diverse and inclusive workforce, though, requires even more than casting the net further. It's engaging in creative opportunities, which will get to the end result of having the female and minority in a position to be the best qualified. Um, whether it's financial assistance, whether it's actually a donating to community uh, organizations, the greater your community involvement and your generosity, whether it's donating to the food bank, what we've seen recently are our corporate um, actors from a standpoint of uh, donating laptops and facilitating access to the internet, um, scholarships, the greater likely that females and minorities will be interested in joining your company, the community player. What we know is that these acts and practices of generosity, they are, and these commendable outreach practices, they're not going to lead to a reverse discrimination claim. And again, in the long term, more likely to have created the foundation to achieve the business objective of diversity and inclusion. You know, more examples of tools. The key is whether it's job um, boards, advertising in the, the social media in a way that emphasizes diversity and inclusion, uh, promoting a, a work-life balance, not to forget that uh, 
diversity and inclusion can be successful, not just by casting that net uh, further, but by developing those policies inside that are attractive and retain those individuals that that you do uh, have who are females and minorities. Highlight those successes, celebrate the successes of females and minorities. Um, the, the, the key is that ideally your CEO s- sets the vision and you actually create d as a business function with the objective of providing employees with a sense of equity and fairness. Now back to Bob with some final comments on uh, tools for achieving diversity. Th- thank you, Leslie. A lot of clients emphasize to us that, look, our issue with more effectively pursuing diversity is not just about recruiting. It's about promoting more effectively women and minorities within the organization into higher ranks, into executive management, and particularly in areas of the company where these groups are historically unrepresented, engineering, science, et cetera. How do we, how do we not just recruit more effectively, how do we promote in advance more effectively. And a lot of that is about the environment you create. Your harassment policies, et cetera, are really important to creating the kind of environment where women and minorities feel welcome and they feel like they can flourish. Also, promotion and advancement opportunities. Make them transparent. There should They shouldn't be secret. Make position opportunities available and make them freely uh open to everyone. When you have secretive promotion and advancement systems, you make women and minorities feel like the, the, stack, the, the deck is stacked against them. Thoughtfully and continually vet your com- compensation processes. There is, as we discussed at the beginning, historically uh, discrimination in compensation against women and minorities. And it takes an ongoing effort. And if you do that effectively, Women minorities are going to stick with your company. They're going to be pleased with your company. You are going to succeed as a business entity. Also, utilize your portal very effectively. Utilize your social media accounts. Of course, as many of you do, celebrate a diverse workforce through all of these tools. Make people feel good about the makeup of your workforce and your efforts to pursue diversity. Use employee surveys effectively to get a sense for where you are, what employees are thinking, and how you can move the ball forward. Carefully and cautiously consider the value and risks of uh, of, uh, employee resource groups, whether they be affinity groups, networking groups, inclusion groups, affinity groups that are often targeted to a particular group, maybe a racial group or a gender, are more challenging because they're, they're, they seem to be exclusionary by nature. And that's why some companies like Deloitte are moving towards inclusion groups that don't involve, that aren't targeted to a single uh, sector of the workforce, but incorporate everyone. But employee resource groups, use them very carefully and make sure and effectively and make sure you remain aware of the National Labor Relations Act and don't create an internal employee organization that constitutes an unlawful labor organization under the NLRA. One final point I want to make, and we really saw this through the Floyd tragedy and a lot of the racial controversies that that we've seen in recent years, which is companies need to actively oppose social injustice. Uh, I can tell you companies took note of which companies had chief executive officers speaking out about what happened to Mr. Floyd and those who chose to remain silent. Companies that want to pursue diversity effectively in today's world have to be let, let it be known that they oppose social injustice and that, as Leslie described, they're going to marshal their resources to aid the marginalized in society. I hope you found our presentation today helpful We certainly appreciate you joining us, and we wish you the best of luck with your diversity and inclusion efforts going forward. Thank you.